Well, we know a couple of things. First of all, this was launched, this attack was launched from inside Russia. And Americans are always saying, well, you know, what's wrong with the Russians? How can't can't they secure their borders? (laughs) They have 1,100 miles to be concerned about. That's quite a border. Uh, And it's inevitably going to be penetrated. Most of it is heavily forested. Uh, What isn't forested involves large rivers. So trying to secure all of it is difficult. Uh, Somebody said that roughly 19 of these drones were launched. Uh, All were shot down except these three, and these three exploded harmlessly on the ground. Now, as far as the payload is concerned, I'm a little skeptical of the size. You can make a small explosion look like a big one, depending upon, you know, where you photograph it. Uh, the, I think they were using uh, the Orlan drones that were originally devised or developed in the Soviet period, and they carry a payload of perhaps 30, 40 pounds of explosive max. So I, I have difficulty believing that that was a four, 500 or 1,000 pound bomb. Uh, Are the Russian uh, air defenses uh, weak? No, absolutely not. Well, how did this get through? How would something like this get through? If this had hit the president's house, it would have destroyed it, I would imagine. Yeah, well, it it didn't come anywhere near the house. It's a residential area, but they seem to have petered out on their own. It may be they ran out of fuel or they had some kind of problem with the motors. Or it could also be they were jammed because uh, the Russians have done a brilliant job. They probably knock three or 400 Ukrainian drones out of the air every day, thanks to their jamming systems, which are the best in the world. So I, you know, I don't know, except that I, I'm not even sure this was Ukrainian. Uh, there's some evidence that uh, the SAS is involved penetrating into Russia and what, what, what's that. SAS Colonel special air service. That's the British equivalent of special operations. Uh, They ultimately, behind the scenes, took credit for the explosion that was an attempt to disable the bridge between Crimea and Russia. Uh, They're very good at this sort of thing. I'm sure that that's a distinct possibility. If they were Ukrainian, they had they had someone with them that knew what they were doing. If if they were Ukrainian, is it likely that American intelligence knew about it? And if the answer to that is yes, is it likely that the DOD or the Department of State or the National Security Council or whoever's giving Ukraine marching orders knew about it? I'm trying to figure out if President Putin would have an argument that Joe Biden or somebody who works for him ordered an attack on his house. Well, I'm sure President Biden would insist on uh, plausible deniability. Uh, well, I wasn't informed uh, or we, we did not urge them to do that, something like that. You have, to, you have to be realistic. Everything they do is based on data that we provide to them. In other mm. words, overhead surveillance, overhead photography, down to the smallest detail. These things are not accidental. So the, the intelligence support is absolutely, definitely there. Uh, but again, plausible deniability. They didn't tell us they were going to do it today. I, I remember another public figure who said, uh, I feel your pain but I did not have sex with that woman. Yes. Okay. And we, did, we later discovered, oh gosh, surprise, surprise, he had sex with her. So <clears throat> I think this falls into the same category. I, I would not expect him to say anything else, but I would not impute any, uh, any integrity to it. I'm just uh, trying to come to grips with the idea that the United States government may have looked the other way or facilitated uh, an attack on, on the capital of Russia and, and whether they have the remotest idea of the ramifications of that behavior. Well, the combination of arrogance and self-delusion is very powerful. <clears throat> Remember, the, the majority of people that you're dealing with in Washington today still view Russia through the lens of 1994, 95. They think they're dealing with a a failed state that uh, has a weak economy, uh, a society that is on the verge of revolt. I mean, these kinds of things are widely believed. Uh, None of it's true. Uh, Anyone else with half a brain understands the economy in Russia is very strong. Russia has the resources and the capability to last Mm -hmm. indefinitely. They have a huge manpower pool. I mean, we go go down the list. It's just not true. 
But unfortunately, these, these delusions persist. And then you add this to arrogance. And they think also that we are the same military power that we were in 1991. And judge, we're not. Uh, there's nothing we have today that the Russians do not also have. Whatever advantages we once had in many key areas, they're gone. Yeah, well, she's telling you the truth. Uh, everything she said is accurate. I obviously don't support the policy position. She would have made a great spokesman for the Soviet Armed Forces back <laughs> in the Second World War in 1941 when the heroic forces of the motherland were throwing back the Wehrmacht. We all know that didn't happen. Went on for years. So this, this is the sort of thing you just, you just take it in. You understand that this person is part of a, of a partisan group of people who are determined to keep us at war and not just us, but our allies, and they will do anything in their power to sustain this. And if that involves lying, then so be it. Well, there are two kinds of fools. There's the harmless fool that tells funny jokes and is self-deprecating. And then there are dangerous fools. This man falls into the second category. He's a dangerous fool. He does not understand what he confronts. He does not understand the, the consequences of our actions that could ultimately spread to Europe and ultimately to the United States. Russia is not just a great power. It is one of the great powers on the planet. And uh, he doesn't seem to get it. He doesn't want to believe that. He's happy with the delusion and the arrogance. And that's what you saw. Remember, he, uh, at the outset of uh, the military uh, conflagration, advised uh, President Biden in a very public way that Putin should be assassinated. Yeah, of course. Well, look, the Senate is a strange place, Judge. The Senate is uh, the closest thing that you're going to find to fantasy land in politics. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, an, a Mount Olympus with a, a circus on it. And people bloviate in it all the time, saying lots of things for which they're never held accountable and which they that don't really ultimately involve themselves. They say it for effect. He's one of the best, uh, says lots of things for effect. And he assumes that the, you know, there's no buck stopping at his door. And he misses the point that dragging us into a major war with Russia would be catastrophic for us, for Europe, for the Russians. Well, he's a combat lawyer, remember. Uh, he served as an attorney in uh, places like Iraq and Afghanistan for brief periods as an attorney on the staff of generals. So he knows all there is to know about war. <laughs> you know, these, these people are dangerous because... Did you ever drive a tank in, in combat? <laughs> well, I mean, he just doesn't understand, doesn't, doesn't get it, and he doesn't think there are consequences for his actions or his speech. He's wrong. And I think we're going to see that in the near future, unfortunately. Well, I think you saw evidence for this planning several months ago when you saw a picture of Mr. Zelensky seated at a table with uh, Bank Friedman, uh, who subsequently was revealed as a huge fraud, and uh, Larry Fink from Black uh, Rock. These are some of the key figures that uh, are involved in deciding what's going to happen to Ukraine when, quote unquote, they win. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd want any of those people deciding the future of anything inside the United States, least of all my home state or the city where I grew up or anything else. But that's those are the people driving this train. You've got to go back and always ask the question, who are the oligarchs? You know, I always talk about government by donor. The government in Washington doesn't pay any attention to you or me. We're irrelevant. We're not mega donors. The mega donors own Washington, D.C. They're the ones making these decisions. Identify them, figure out who they are, where their money is going. We've seen some in the past, like Zuckerberg, for instance, a good example, but there are many others. They're donating and they're shaping policy. They're determining that we're going to fight this to the bitter end in Ukraine. It's not Biden. Biden's a cutout. He's just a front man. He's being handed the script. And he delivers it with enthusiasm. But that's where we are. So none of this should be surprising to the American people. The real question is, how long do they put up with this?